Thanks for coming from the Keys. Yep. Right, another big hand for Marshall. And especially the entire Chaos crew here, guys. This doesn't happen on its own. They've been busting their butts all day to prep for this. Not only Brian, of course, cooking all night. Brian, Brian, again, thank you very much. You make a difference in all of our lives, pal, and the entire crew here, so we can't thank them enough. Guys, just want to get started here and remind you that all of our previous seminars that we've done here at Chaos are... Uh, eventually will be available on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash Florida Sport Fishing. You could also see our latest seminars and you'll have access to this one or if anybody wants to, you know, mention to somebody that wasn't here, they can see it on our streaming channel, which is fsftv.com. The only thing that I ask of everybody is please, if you pick up a couple of tips here tonight and you feel like it was a worthwhile you know, endeavor and it really is going to help you be a more successful angler, please subscribe and join my streaming channel. I want to remind you of that web address. It's fsftv.com. Over 300 instructional videos. There's also a 24-7 fishing helpline. Anything you need related to saltwater fishing anywhere in Florida, you email me. And unless I'm sleeping or fishing, I'm going to instantly follow back up with you and help you with anything that I possibly can. So um, that in itself is worth a few bucks a month, okay? So we've got a really, really cool seminar tonight. We're going to be talking about Monster Mutton Snapper. Who likes Mutton Snapper? Okay. Who likes Mutton Snapper this big? Okay. I know one person that likes Mutton Snapper this big, okay? Um, really an absolutely awesome, awesome species. And there's so much to discuss about mutton snapper that I think we're just going to start at the beginning, okay? The beginning is a place called Riley's Hump. Riley's Hump, anybody know where Riley's Hump is? Tortugas. Dry Tortugas. Now, what is so special about Riley's Hump is it's a spawning aggregation site. Every year, Thousands and thousands of mutton snappers up to this size congregate at Riley's Hump and the Dry Tortugas and they make babies, okay? Uh, around the full moon period, June, July, and before you jump to any conclusions, Riley's Hump is completely closed to recreational angling. So you're not going to go there and sink the boat with 100 big muttons because you can't fish there. But nevertheless, all of these muttons make their way to Riley's Hump. And they spawn, make babies, and then from there, they wander off. Some of them go up into the Gulf of Mexico, and other fish will come around the Keys and all the way up the coast here. And then once again, a year later, they'll all congregate there. Now, we're not talking about the big mutton snappers over in the Bahamas, because they are not crossing the Gulf Stream to the dry tortugas to make babies. Okay, they do it there in their own spawning aggregation sites. Now, understand that these eggs that are fertilized now float to the surface and they float around with the Gulf Stream current, with the loop current, and eventually those eggs, of course, hatch and little juvenile mutton snappers are born, which make their way into seagrass beds and ultimately mangrove shorelines, and they slowly grow from there. Mutton snapper is a relatively slow-growing species, a fish this size. Anybody want to take a stab at how old this size, 30-inch mutton snapper, full-grown, it's as big as they get, how old is this fish? 15 years. Approximately 20 years old, exactly. So they have a lifespan of approximately 18 to 20 years. Now, this is an absolutely magnificent predator, highly prized, okay, perhaps the most prized. Now, of course, there are some snapper that are really, really glamorous, for example, queen snapper. Everybody loves those bright red queen snapper, but you've got to fish really deep water. We don't have any queen snapper right here, okay? We certainly catch them off the keys, which, by the way, in the event that you didn't know, after fishing here in Pompano Beach for 25 years, a year ago, I relocated to Marathon in the Florida Keys. So I know a lot about fishing here, and I'm learning a lot about fishing down there. But one thing I know for sure, there are no queen snappers here. Okay, off of our coast. Um, and again, 
very glamorous, but generally you have to fish much further offshore, electric rod and reels, whereas mutton snapper can be caught from almost any vessel. As a matter of fact, I have actually caught keeper size mutton snappers while surf fishing, okay? Literally casting for bluefish up off Boca and caught 18 to 20 inch mutton snappers when it was really rough. And keep that in mind, when it is rough, which I believe it's been pretty rough here lately, um, the snapper fishing typically picks up and peaks, you know, during the winter months. So don't discount rough weather for snapper fishing. Anyhow, so let's get back to it. As I mentioned, the mutton snapper can be targeted from almost any size vessel. Kayakers catch mutton snappers. Guys on paddle boards, believe it or not. And as I mentioned, not that you're going to intently, you know, surf fish for them, but you could catch them off the beach. Now, off of our area here, there's not a lot of healthy reef. We all know that, right? It's no secret. The mutton snapper fishing off the, you know, Broward County area here, excuse my language, sucks. It really does. It's just not that good. Can you catch some? Absolutely. You absolutely can catch some, but you really got to be dialed in, really have to be dialed in. And the truth is, for many years while I fished up here, very rarely did I target mutton snapper because, you know, there were just better fish or more fish or other venues to target. Very rarely did I wake up and say, I'm going to specifically go mutton snapper fishing. However, I think part of that reason is because I didn't know then what I know now. Since I've moved to the Keys, I've made it a mission to master the mutton, the mutton snapper fishing down in the Keys. That has just been my goal, um, along with Wahoo fishing down there. I'm really, really focused on certain fisheries that I find to be incredibly challenging. Anybody can go out and catch yellowtail snappers, right? We're all familiar, everybody familiar with yellowtail snapper? Really easy to catch. How many people can go out and consistently catch 30-inch mutton snappers? Very, very challenging. So what I'm going to do is share with you everything that I use, that I've learned, uh, that I look for, how I do it, why I do it, where I do it, etc. Now, where you employ those tactics is not up to me. If you fish down in the Keys, I encourage you to do this, to do everything that I mentioned to you. And if you fish here, I would do it here too because I am certain that these tactics are just as productive here. There just aren't as many snapper up here. Why? Because this is a bottom dwelling species, right? Mutton snapper typically do not come way up off the bottom. Very rarely are you gonna see a mutton snapper anywhere, I don't wanna say very rarely, never, are you gonna see a mutton snapper up on the surface, okay? But they will come up off the bottom. It's not like a grouper that hides in a hole on a wreck somewhere. This fish is roaming. He's swimming around constantly. He's never just sitting still. A grouper will hover, right? We all know that. A grouper will hover. Mutton snapper will not hover. They are constantly on the prowl, on the hunt. They're constantly looking for food. They travel a lot. They're always moving. They need big meals. And let me tell you something, they are picky. They have incredible eyesight, more importantly, an incredible sense of smell. And I like to say, if it doesn't look right, smell right, or move right, guess what? They're not touching it because it isn't right. Because this is the type of predator that could eat almost anything that it wants. I found lobster inside big mutton snappers, crabs, every bait fish that is known to man, juvenile snappers. They could eat whatever they would like. They have very, very powerful jaws with sharp crushers that can crush any shellfish that's down there. They have a powerful, large, broom-like tail. And let me tell you something. Take the time to study the species that you're targeting, and it's fascinating what you learn and how you can incorporate that information into your approach into fooling these predators. And knowing their feeding habits is really, really important. So again, it's an absolutely awesome species, very challenging, the bigger fish, not only to find, but to fool, okay? Because I'm gonna tell you that just because you find mutton snapper does not mean they're gonna eat, okay? Does not mean they're gonna eat. Look, there's a whole pile of food outside, a whole pile of it. There's 125 people right here. You wanna know how many of you guys are eating right now? 
Okay, I want you to think about that for a second. It's the same with mutton snappers. There could be an abundance of prey, an abundance of food. There could be fish there, but that doesn't mean that they're eating. So you also have to not only find them and fool them, but you got to have a little lady luck on your side, right? Because you've got to be at the right place at the right time. And I'm also going to tell you to be successful with these big mutton snappers. You need a few key ingredients. One of them is patience. Patience. When I say patience, if you're one of those people, like my wife, who fishes for 10 minutes and goes, let's move. I didn't catch anything, let's move. Let's go. And I'm like, my God, I'm not even there to the spot yet. Okay, she's very impatient. That you, you need a lot of patience when it comes to mutton snapper. Number two, you need to be persistent. You need to be very focused and say to yourself, listen, I want to target and catch these trophy size, mature mutton snapper. That's what I'm going to go out and do. You can't say, I'm going to try for an hour, and if I'm unsuccessful, forget it. That really stinks. I'm going to go do something else because it's too easy to take that easy road. It's too easy, especially in the Keys, by the way. Guys will go out, charter guys. They have clients on the boat. The clients need to catch fish. They want to catch fish, right? They go try maybe fish some deeper spots for muttons. If they don't catch them in an hour or two, the captains have to make a decision. They got to make a call. They got to talk to their crew and say, hey, we got to go. If you want to load up the box with something to take home or if you want some action, I don't know if this is going to come together. Let's go refishing and fish for yellowtails or mangroves or mackerel or one of the other many fisheries that are available. And it's easy to do that here too. So again, you really need to have the patience, you need to be persistent. Also, you need to have a really strong attention to detail, okay? Mutton snapper fishing for these big mutton snappers, they will exploit every single weak link that you could possibly have. Remember what I said before, if the bait doesn't look right, smell right, or move right, they won't touch it. That's number one. Your tackle, any weak link in the tackle will fail. I promise you, it's going to fail. Okay, if your knot doesn't look right, do you know why a knot doesn't look right? Because it isn't right. <laughs> it's common sense. It's not right. Cut it. Retie it. Okay, period. There's no ifs, ands, or buts there. It's something so tiny. But if it's not right, it's going to fail. And one of the knots that we're going to talk about, we're going to get into, is a loop knot. Okay, and if that loop knot is not absolutely perfect in the braid, the braid will fail every single time you hook a big fish. Forget the little fish. I'm not going after 16-inch muttons. I'm going after 30-inch muttons, okay? I'm going after the big boys, okay? That's what I want because, well, that's the mindset that I have and what I'm going to teach you tonight. So we know the fish itself is absolutely amazing. You know, their feeding habits, they're constantly on the move. We know that as far as eating quality, who here has eaten mutton snapper? One of, if not the best fish to eat, right? Absolutely delicious. They're beautiful fish. They look just absolutely gorgeous. You know, bright pinks and, and reds and yellows, but of course pink is the predominant color. It's a beautiful fish. It's a very, very hard fighting fish for the first 150 feet, okay? Because once he gets up off the bottom, that fish is gonna bloat and that fight is over and suddenly you're just gonna feel dead weight because that mutton is going in circles like this and just floating up to the surface at that stage when you're up near the surface. You know, when you're within, I don't wanna say 50 feet because of course it depends on the depth, but once you get him up, way up off the bottom, he's just gonna bloat and float. But while he's on the bottom, it's a very, very hard fighting fish and a tremendous amount of fun to catch and very, very rewarding. Everybody's just like, Wow, I got a big mutton, you know, it's just really, really rewarding. So time of the year. Well, remember what I said that the spawning cycle is in the spring and summer, okay? Winter time, on the other hand, is peak mutton fishing because they all scatter from that spawning area and they're all roaming in other areas up into the Gulf and of course all the way up around up into the Atlantic here. During the spring and summer, they're all making their way back to Riley's, okay, back making babies. So winter time from, I would say, September, October, like fall, 
through the winter is really gonna be your peak mutton snapper fishery, even here. And while you may believe that it's a, you know, it's not even worth trying here, it is. I just saw, you know, Art from Native Sun, I know you, a lot of you guys have heard that name. He caught four the other day. Four big ones right out front, okay? They're there, they're there. I'm not saying they're there like we have them, but obviously enough to, to focus on trying to catch them. It's just all about doing it the right way. So understand that mutton snapper are structure-oriented species, right? They relate to reefs, they relate to wrecks. Okay, that's, and even when they're young, they relate to structure, they relate to mangrove shorelines, to grass beds, but as they mature, and once they reach that 16 to 18 inch size, that fish, by the way, is now sexually mature, and he now is traveling back, he or she, to Riley's hump to make babies at that 16 to 18 inch size, okay? But beyond that, once they're in that 24, 26, 28, 30 inch trophy size, you know, they, they're not in the grass any longer, they're not in the mangroves, they're in deeper water, typically 150 to 250. That's gonna be your zone, 150 to 250 feet of water, okay, is where you're gonna be targeting these large mutton snappers. There has to be some structure in the area, but it does Sorry, we'll wait for you. You good? Okay. Um, nevertheless, there has to be some structure in the area, but don't think that you need to be right on top of it. Mutton snappers are famous for roaming in the sand from spot to spot, for swimming in the sand around a piece of structure and around a wreck. And I wanna point something out that it's really, really important. When I moved to the Keys just over a year ago, I, again, you know, was very focused on these big mutton snappers. And everybody said to me, well, of course, well, not, that I didn't know, but you had to go wreck fishing, right? You had to go wreck fishing. Well, here we have wrecks. What's the average size wreck that we have out here? 200 foot. 200 foot, okay? There's all sorts of freighters, there's tugs, there's this, there's that. And when somebody says, I'm gonna go fish the wrecks outside of Pompano or Fort Lauderdale or Boca, it's a wreck, it's a sunken ship. So I go down to Marathon and I'm looking for wrecks and mutton snappers and learning the ropes, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And I'm just looking, looking, looking for wrecks. I don't find any, I don't find any. And, and how do I look? I put out my Wahoo spread and I'm Wahoo trolling down 100 feet for 10 miles. And then I'll turn around and come back 125 feet for 10 miles. And then I'll turn around, in other words, a grid. And I'll just keep going 25 feet while constantly staring at my machines to identify any sort of structure on the bottom that I could then come back and investigate further. You gotta put in the time, you gotta put in the legwork. No one is gonna walk up to you and go, here's a chip with a thousand numbers, okay? Nobody's gonna do that. It's not gonna be me. I know you were asking for the numbers. I'm not giving them to you, okay? So how else do you do it? You network with other captains, you know, give somebody something and then maybe they'll give you something in return, you know, but there's no substitute for time spent on the water. And it's incredibly rewarding to be able to go out there and go, oh, there's a spot, I found it, let me fish it, boom, I've caught muttons there. You know, that's where it all starts, it starts at one spot. So I don't care if you're fishing out here, if you're fishing down there, wherever it may be, you've gotta be willing to put in the effort in order to be rewarded because it shouldn't come easy. A 30 inch mutton snapper or 10 30 inch mutton snappers on a trip should not come easy, okay? They're trophy fish that are highly prized and it, it requires you to make an effort, it really does. Nevertheless, back to my story, I'm down in the Keys and I'm looking for all of these wrecks of which I'm finding none, okay? Then I sit down with a local captain and we're talking and we're talking about, of course, mutton fishing and wreck fishing. And he says to me, what are you looking for? He says, I'm looking for wrecks. He says, what kind of wrecks? So I explained to him the wrecks that we find up here. He goes, no, 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 no. He goes, you're looking for a 200 foot freighter. He goes, we don't have 200 foot freighters here. We have refrigerators. I said, what? He goes, we got a refrigerator. He goes, we got a guy who took an aluminum structure like this off the top of his boat, went out there and dumped it in the water. That's a wreck. That's what they call a wreck in the Florida Keys, okay? And I'm like, oh, and a light bulb went off.
because all along I'm looking for the wrong thing. Yes, there are large wrecks, but the large wrecks that were intentionally sunk, okay, as dive sites. Well, I don't want to fish anywhere near a dive site. That's number one. Any of the old schooners and ships that ultimately hit the reef in the Florida Keys and sunk are long, long gone. They were all wood. They've deteriorated or been completely covered up by storms. So it's not like you're going to find the Adolfo Bush, you know, or whatever, a big giant wreck just sitting out in 250 feet. It's not going to happen. They're not there. I promise you. There are some structures, but nothing like what you would expect up here. So then once you realize that what you're looking for is just a small piece of bottom, you then need to realize that these mutton snapper do not hold tight to that structure. And you don't want to fish tight to that structure because guess who's around that structure? Sharks. sharks. And sharks' favorite food in the Florida Keys are my mutton snappers, okay? <laughs> Nobody else's. Well, they might like other people's, but they definitely like mine. I'm telling you that right now. So you could expect, I'm going to use a round number and say 25% of the big mutton snapper that you hook are going to get eaten by sharks. And that is if you take the necessary precautions. When I first started mutton snapper fishing, I was fishing really tight to the wrecks. 75% of my muttons would get eaten by sharks. And then I sat there one day and said, what am I doing? I'm wasting all this tackle, but more importantly, I'm taking beautiful 30-inch muttons and feeding them to bull sharks and other sorts of sharks that are swimming around one after the other. And I don't know if there's anything more frustrating than that. The key to hooking, finding, and landing these big mutton snappers is get away from the structure. Fish away from it, okay? Take your boat, find the wreck. And now this applies right here too. There are massive wrecks off of Fort Lauderdale. There are massive wrecks right out here. There are wrecks up off of Boca. Find a wreck on your chart plotter, on your sounder, whatever it is that you're going to do. Stop the boat right on the wreck. Just stop, okay? That's your starting point. Because if you stop the boat directly on top of the wreck, you're always going to be moving down current away from the wreck or downwind, whatever the conditions are doing. Nine out of ten times, that's where the fish are held up down current or downwind of the structure. So if I stop my boat right on the wreck, and if I give it a few minutes to prepare, to get the rods ready, to get baited up, and I drop just off the wreck, now I'm drifting away from it. Everybody follow me there? That is absolutely vital, okay? Now, how far away from that structure? Easily three to 400 yards, easily, if not further. Do not by any means think, oh, that wreck is across the street right there. I'm not going to get a bite. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. I promise you. You'll be surprised. Because remember that they're not only roaming around that wreck, but they're moving to other spots in that same depth zone. So you're essentially looking for an open water bottom fish that relates to structure, but is not tight to the structure, if that kind of makes sense. And I think that it does, right? So... Find the structure, find the wreck, but don't fish directly on top of it or anywhere close to it. You know, when, I'm, when I mean close to it, if you can read it on your machine, you're going to get sharked or you stand a chance of getting sharked. Or at the very least, you're going to get hung up in the bottom and it's going to be a frustrating experience. So like I said, don't be afraid to fish in the wide open. Here in this area, I've caught a lot of months. I've caught them 30 feet of water on the patches up off of Boca, off of Spanish River. Okay, I've caught nice muttons up there, but not consistently, you know, and not specifically targeting them because we were targeting yellowtails or mangroves, and then suddenly you just get, you know, one nice mutton that comes up. It's nowhere near as consistent as, for example, the Florida Keys, or if you're specifically targeting them. So also understand that mutton snappers, like I said earlier, don't feed all day long. I have read them on my machine, and I know, I've learned, when I look at my Furuno fish finder, I zoom in on the bottom, split screen, entire depth, left part of the screen, zoomed into the bottom 20 feet of the water column. 
That's what's important to me, that bottom 20 feet of the water column, because that's where those muttons are gonna be. And the big muttons show up every single time the same exact way. It's a big V, they have lines, everybody's got a different machine. I can't tell you what they're gonna look like on your machine, but I know when there are mutton snappers on the bottom, I'm like, boom, there they are, we're gonna get a bite, or hopefully we're gonna get a bite. And there have been many, many times where I'll read them and they won't bite. No matter what, they won't bite. We'll try everything, we can't get them to bite. And then at a certain time of the day, boom, it's one, two, one, two, three, and suddenly they start biting. So you gotta read them, you have to know they're there, but don't be under the impression that they're gonna eat all of the time. Like for example, a dolphin, right? Dolphin eat all of the time. Mackerel, kingfish practically eat all of the time. Blackfin tuna eat all of the time. They could be chocked full of bait where you'd think they couldn't fit another, you know, gram of food in their body and they're still eating your jig. You know, they're just gorging, gorging. Mutton snapper are not like that, boy. They're really selective. They're very selective. They're picky eaters. It's got to look right. Remember what I said? It's got to smell right and they need to be in the mood to feed. And I believe once they eat, you know, a big meal, because keep in mind, this guy is not eating a little piece of bait this big, okay? He's not eating a little tiny bonita chunk or whatever it is you're gonna put on your hook that's this big. He's got a huge mouth and a huge appetite, and he can eat a very big meal. And that's what he wants, because he wants to exert the least amount of energy for the greatest reward. He didn't get this big by being dumb. This is not a dumb fish. This is a very, very brilliant fish. So you've got to really tempt them with something that they can't resist. And even then, they don't always eat it. Now, anchoring versus drifting. I prefer to drift only because I like to cover ground because the mutton snappers are moving. If you were specifically targeting grouper, you better anchor, okay? If you want to catch gags, blacks, you better anchor. Okay, because they don't like that bait moving. They don't want it moving across the bottom. That boat's got to be anchored. That bait's got to be sitting right on the bottom. And then the groupers will eat it. Okay, very rarely are you going to have a really successful grouper trip unless the boat is anchored, okay, regardless of depth. Mutton snapper fishing, as I mentioned, I like to drift. I like to cover ground. When I'm offshore, deep water, wreck fishing. Now, we are going to touch on catching big muttons in 30 feet of water on the patch reefs, and that's all anchoring. That's a different animal. But again, in the deeper water, and anything that you're gonna do out here in 150 to 250 feet of water is going to be drifting. And remember, you're in this awesome zone because 150 to 250, what else do we have? You're already out there. You're out there sail fishing. You're out there looking for kingfish. You're out there who knows what else, right? So while you're drifting, may it be kite fishing or you just have flat lines out, stop for a second and say, wait a minute, I should drop some baits to the bottom, okay? And cover the entire water column and you would be surprised at the mutton snappers that you pick off when you weren't even really expecting it. It's almost like a bonus catch for you, you're already doing that. So I highly encourage you, whenever you're out here kite fishing, at the very least, drop one bait to the bottom, okay? And drift that one bait across the bottom, at the very least. Worst thing that's gonna happen is a big cobia is gonna eat the bait. What a bummer, right? What an absolute bummer. Now understand too, I just touched a little bit and said to you that you can catch mutton snappers on the patch reefs. I don't like to do that. The reason I don't like to do that is because I enjoy the reward of wreck fishing in the Keys, the deeper water, because it's not only mutton snapper. You know what, my bycatch could be wahoo, blackfin tuna, sailfish, cobia, African pompano, all sorts of stuff. So while I'm specifically targeting mutton snapper, there's all of this other bycatch, which I welcome, we all do, right? Versus if I'm anchored up in 30 feet of water, yeah, I'm gonna catch bycatch, I'm gonna catch a yellowtail, that's 12 inches. I'm gonna catch a little mangrove. And yeah, there's days where you catch big yellowtail and big mangroves, but none of them compare to a 30 inch mutton. And that's what I'm focused on. I would rather go out and catch one or two fish and they be like this, than go out and catch 10 or 20 fish and they be like this, okay? That's just me. If you like this, Go anchor up on the reef, okay. Um, getting back to it, like I said, when you're out here anytime drifting, and also look at it from the flip side. 
If you do decide, hey, I'm gonna go out here and go mutton snapper fishing, and I'm gonna fish two or three baits right on the bottom, what else should you be doing? Fish a couple flat lines, right? Because you could pick off some stuff up on top. So I don't care how you do it. Either you're fishing up on top and then you put some baits on the bottom or you're fishing on the bottom and you put some baits on the top. Either way, cover the water column, okay? Now baits, let's talk about that. Down in the Keys, I have three preferences, three absolute go-tos when it comes to targeting these big mutton snapper. A live pinfish, a live pinfish, and a live pinfish. Those are my three baits right there. They're easy to catch, they're easy to keep alive, and everything eats pinfish in the Florida Keys, everything. Sailfish, wahoo, blackfin, tuna, species that you would never think eat pinfish, eat pinfish. You can fish a pinfish on a flat line and catch sailfish. You can fish a pinfish on a bottom, you know, rig and catch a mutton snapper, etc. And anything in the middle, everything, even tunas, like I said, big blackfins. Here, you don't have the pinfish like we have them down there because we have a lot of grass and reef, etc. Pinfish, I don't even think you can buy them anywhere here. Okay, so it's not the ideal bait here because it's not the prevalent forage here. Here I would use a live goggle eye. Okay, a live goggle eye, a big pilchard. I'm not a big fan of pilchards or thread fin herring because they're so fragile. And if it dies, what am I doing? I might as well fish a dead bait. Okay, so a live goggle eye, ballyhoo, excellent bait. However, do not be under the impression that you have to fish a live bait because you don't. You just have to fish a fresh bait. Do not take anything that's been frozen in that bait freezer right there. I don't care what's in that bait freezer. There ain't no 30 inch mutton eating anything that's in that bait freezer. Not gonna happen, okay? I'm telling you that right now. You're better off, and as a matter of fact here, I don't wanna call it a secret or a tip, you call it whatever you wanna call it, but I'm gonna tell you one of the absolute best mutton snapper baits is you take a fresh kingfish, a king mackerel, fillet it, take that fillet, lay it down flat, left to right, right in front of you. Slice it, okay, into thick slices, right, right in front of you. Take the slice, fold it over itself, and hang it from a circle hook, skin to skin. So it's all meat on the outside, we call it a kingfish steak absolute killer mutton snapper bait. It's super fresh, it's super oily, and super readily available, okay? Ballyhoo, if you're gonna fish a ballyhoo, make sure it's a fresh ballyhoo that's never been frozen. Cut the beak off, take a knife, scale it very gently, and butterfly it, okay? Rinse it off a little bit, clean it up. It's all about presentation. You've gotta look at that bait, and you've gotta say, yeah, baby, you look good. Okay, if you don't say that, that mutton snapper is not gonna touch that thing. I'm telling you that right now. It's gotta look good. It's gotta have, if it's alive, it's gotta be lively and perfect. If it's dead, you better make it look alive, okay? And it has to be so enticing. Another trick is take a goggle eye, a fresh goggle eye. Remember, if you can't get live goggle eyes, take a fresh goggle eye, cut it in half diagonally, okay? In other words, so you've got the whole head part and the tail part, hook the head part, and step on it, smush it, okay, smush it a little bit. And all that meat and juices and gooeyness comes out and it's just irresistible to them, primarily because it's so fresh. That's the key, live or fresh. You do not have to hide the hook in the bait. You, as a matter of fact, want the hook exposed. I fish, whenever I'm fishing baits, I fish a VMC 7.0 inline tournament circle hook. It's number 7389 is the model number of the hook. I don't care what hook you fish. You could fish a J hook, you could fish a circle hook. That hook works perfect for me. And I have found that very, very, very rarely, if ever, if ever, will you miss a fish. What I mean by that is I'm fishing, my rod's in the rod holder, and I'll explain why in a minute. The rod goes whack and just doubles over. I got him. He's hooked every time, right in the corner of the mouth, every single time. Am I gonna land that fish? 75% of the time I'm going to, because the other 25% of the Shark time, got shark's got him. Every now and then, a hook will pull. I'm not gonna lie, a hook will come out every now and then. It's fishing, it's gonna happen. Does it mean that if I'm fishing a J hook, because keep in mind, here you can fish J hooks, 
Are you never gonna pull a hook with a J hook? Yes, you are. Who's ever lost a fish with a J hook? If you're not raising your hand, you're lying, okay? Everybody at some point has lost a fish to a J hook. Everybody, okay? It happens, it's fishing. You shouldn't catch every single one of them, okay? You really shouldn't. So again, circle hooks though for me work perfect because nine out of 10 times, I'm fishing for muttons out of the rod holder, okay? I'm not holding the rod in my hand. I'm fishing right out of the rod holder. And I'll explain why in a second. So we talked about baits, right? Pinfish, like I said, down in the keys, awesome. Up here, not so much. If you're gonna fish for them up here, goggle eyes, big pilchards or thread fin, ballyhoo, kingfish steak. You can take a bonita strip. Now, and I don't mean the bonita strip that you troll for kingfish with that you could buy at a local bait shop that look like brown leather. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you just caught a bonita on a kite bait, on a planer, whatever, on a jig. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Now cut a nice, thick, meaty strip and drop that down. They'll eat that in a heartbeat. Okay, they'll eat, I've caught muttons on yellowtail fillets, on almost everything, as long as it's fresh. I cannot stress that enough. It's streamlined, it's clean, and it looks good, it swims right, it's fresh. Now, the rig, lots of options here, okay, depending on what tackle you have access to, depending on where you're fishing, depending on the skill level of the anglers. I can tell you down in the Florida Keys, there is a famous rig that almost all charter boats use, okay? They use it because a spinning reel, which by the way, this is a Saragossa 10,000, it's an absolutely awesome, super smooth, perfect reel for mutton snapper fishing for a wide variety of species, but it makes an ideal mutton snapper reel as well. Plenty of line capacity, loaded with 30 pound braid, but regardless of what you put on the reel, again, we're gonna talk about the rig. And by the way, the, the reel's matched to a Chaos 7 foot, 15 to 30 pound class spinner. If you don't fish chaos rods, you might as well leave now because you'll never catch anything, okay? <laughs> so that's first and foremost. Make sure you're outfitted with chaos rods. I, I mean, I suggest match to Shimano reels as well. Uh, nevertheless, the reason that they fish spinning gear is because it's easy from the family from Wisconsin, okay? It's easy from the guy from Vermont or from wherever it is that they're visiting the Florida Keys and the biggest fish they've ever caught is a six inch bluegill. Okay, and now you're taking them out wreck fishing to try and catch these big giant snappers. And if they fumble around with a lever drag or a two speed reel, which is easy to make a mistake with, okay, applying a little bit too much drag, whatever it may be. So to avoid all of that, they fish spinning reels. So don't think that you cannot catch these big trophy muttons with spinning gear because you certainly can. Okay, you absolutely can. And if this is all that you have, great, fish it, okay? The rig that they fish, some of these guys will have mono, some of these guys will have braid. Either way, the rig culminates the same way. Now in my particular case, the way that I have this rig, which by the way, I'm not the guy from Wisconsin or Vermont and I don't fish spinners for muttons, but I rigged this one just to show you. I've got 30 pound braid on the reel and then there's a very small little Albright knot. It's right there on my thumb. You can probably, I don't even know if you can see it or not. Okay, it's a very, very small Albright knot to a very short section of 50 pound mono, okay? Three, four feet, right there. And then there's an egg sinker right there, as you can see that slides and that hits a little barrel swivel, okay? Now the reason the mono is here and the reason that I don't go straight from the braid all the way to the swivel is because as this lead slides up and down over and over the inside of that hole weakens the braid and it frays the braid. And then you have a weak spot and you have what we call premature tackle failure, okay? And you end up losing the fish because you get a big fish on and pop, the braid is no longer 30 pound test, it's three pound test because there's only two strands holding it together. So by tying just a small piece of mono, now the lead is only sliding on the mono. From there, barrel swivel, 30 feet, of fi and again, this is not my rig, this is your typical charter boat rig, it's a staple and it works. 30 feet of 50 pound monofilament, to that same 7-0 circle hook. Now you can see that's 30 feet. I just have it wound up so it's you know obviously not all over the place. Now, 
Very easy rig to fish. However, it's a challenging rig to deal with because I've got the lead is on the line. It can't come off the line. Once the lead reaches my rod tip as I'm fighting a fish or as, you know, Joanne from Vermont is fighting her fish and that reaches, sorry about that. I don't want to hook anybody that, boom, the lead is up there. Now she can't reel anymore, right? She can't reel anymore and there's 30 feet of leader. Now she's going to try and reel. I promise you, she's going to try and reel that lead <laughs> all the way through those guides. I promise you that, okay? So just keep that in mind. But nevertheless, it's up there. You can't reel anymore. So you have 30 feet that now you have to hand line. But the truth of the matter is the fight is essentially over because when that fish is 30 feet away from the boat, he's done. He's just whoop, floating. And all you're going to see is this you're gonna be like, what's that? Oh, it's a big mutton, and poof, he's gonna break the surface, and this beautiful mutton's just gonna be laying there. He's not gonna be flopping around. He's not gonna be swimming around. He's dead. He's done. He might not be dead, but he's gonna be dead pretty soon. And at that stage, you just slowly hand line them in, okay? They'll generally fish two of these, one off each corner of the back of the boat, and they will drift, and sometimes they will power drift in reverse. And what do I mean by that? The current or the wind is right here in my face. If I turn around, the current and the wind are pushing me this way. The spot that I want to fish is right there, right behind me. They will drop two of these baits. They'll put this rod in this rod holder in the corner. They'll put another one in this rod holder. And the guy at the wheel will stand here just like this with his hand on the throttles and he will hold the boat in reverse in position. Okay, so he's bumping the boat into reverse, pushing up against the current. This way, the two baits are right here in what they believe is the strike zone, as close to the structure as possible. Because when you're on a charter, Guess what? Joanna from Wisconsin would love to catch a 40-pound amberjack, okay? She'd love to catch a big barracuda. She'd love all of that. And the captain on the charter boat would love that too because he's going to sell her a mount of that trophy, okay? <laughs> but that's a different story altogether. Nevertheless, that's how they generally fish. So it works. You could do something as simple as that. And it's effective. It's simple. There's not a lot of ways you can mess up. But again, you now have this long 30 foot leader that you have to deal with. So a lot of guys will sometimes just cut the lead off, they'll cut the rig off, everybody has their own way of dealing with this, okay? And then I realized a completely different way of dealing with it and that was just not to deal with it at all because I don't like that rig. However, I am gonna tell you that you can fish that rig. There is a time when I fish that rig. When I put it this exact same rig, on a conventional outfit and I'm actively fishing. The rod is in my hand and I'm feeding the bait out. I've hit the bottom, okay? The boat is drifting and I'm slowly paying out line. I'm increasing the distance from me to the bait. The bait's back there, it hit the bottom. I'm slowly paying out line, I'm actively fishing. I get a bite and trust me, there is absolutely no confusion or mistaken when this guy eats your bait. If you're not sure, this is not what is eating your bait. Okay, I promise you. If you're not sure, if you're going, I think I'm getting a bite. If you think you're getting a bite, this is not what you're getting a bite from. Okay, I promise you. You will know when a big mutton snapper eats your bait. I promise you that. So as I'm actively feeding it out, if I get that bite and understand what's happening, that mutton snapper, he's approached that pinfish. The pinfish now is, excuse my language, shit scared, okay? He knows what's about to happen. And you could feel all of that through the rod. If you were holding it, you could feel, wait a minute, something's going on here. And next thing you feel is a boom. And what that boom is, is that mutton snapper just went whoop and engulfed that entire bait. He's not nibbling on the tail, taking a little taste. No, he ate it. It's in his mouth, okay? That's what he's doing. He's not trying to bite a piece off of it because that's not how they feed. They swallow their prey whole. So he's grabbed it. It's in his mouth. And now he's running. He's running across the bottom. Why is he running across the bottom? Because he's using the water pressure to force that bait down his throat and to prevent the live bait 
from escaping out of his mouth and he's crushing it and turning it in his mouth. So there's a lot happening and he's running and running and running and line is just peeling off, you know, the reel. And at that stage, obviously, fishing a circle hook, all you have to do is just push that lever forward. The line's gonna come tight and you're hooked up. Line's gonna come screaming off the reel. I promise this is what's gonna happen as long as your drag is set properly. Do not attempt to stop that fish on the first run. You will lose, something will break. Some, you're not, the hook will pull, something will fail if you attempt to stop that fish on his first run. He's a very, very strong fish. He doesn't know what just happened other than the fact that something isn't right. In a very big way, something is not right. So he's panicking and he's scooting across the bottom. He's not like a grouper looking for a ledge. So don't go, oh man, I gotta stop him, otherwise he's gonna get in a hole. No, he's not. No, he's not. That's not how a mutton snapper reacts. So don't look at it like a grouper, even though they're both, you know, I don't even wanna say somewhat similar bottom species, cause they're not. Um, let them go, okay? And then once he slows down, then you can start to fight the fish. But backing up, that's the only time that I'll fish that rig is when it's actively in my hand and I can control it. However, that's a very rare occasion because every time, for the most part, 99% of the time, when I'm out mutton snapper fishing, I'm fishing my live baits out of the rod holders and I'm jigging, okay? I'm fishing a jig with my, obviously, free hands. So I'm not worried about feeding a bait out because there are days when the mutton snappers will eat the meat and there are days when they'll eat the metal. So I always like to cover both bases and we'll talk more about jigging in a minute. Let's get back to the rigs. So my preference in rigs is to fish a conventional outfit. This is a Chaos 8-foot conventional rod rated for 20 to 40 pound line. It's the absolute perfect rod for wreck fishing down in the Keys. People say to me, why do you like an 8-foot rod instead of a 7-foot rod? Because of course, 7-foot seems to be the standard. Well, I like it for various reasons. One, it gives me a little bit more leverage. It's a little bit softer up at the top and a little bit longer, so it's easy to detect every move. It's easy to hold it out away from the boat when a fish is going around the motors or under the boat. It's easier to lob a lead out away from the boat. So there are various reasons. I also had these rods built. If you're fishing on a head boat, on a party boat, long range or something like that, you'll appreciate the extra length in the rod. So a lot of reasons there. The rod is matched to a Shimano Talica 12. This is a 12 2 It's a two-speed rod. Really, really nice. Is a two-speed reel necessary when you are mutton snapper fishing? The answer is no. It's not necessary, but it certainly is nice because once you hook a big mutton, you can pop that into low gear and just crank. And now at least he's coming up toward the boat and away from sharks, okay? And anything you can do, I'm telling you, to keep these things away from the sharks is gonna be a benefit to you. So again, for many years, I fished with a single speed reel. I just recently started fishing a two speed for the muttons and already I'm appreciating the benefits, but it's not absolutely necessary. The reel is loaded with 40 pound diamond braid. Okay, 40 pound diamond braid. I don't care about the color, makes no difference. Now I'm gonna start at the bottom of the rig. Same 7.0. VMC inline tournament circle hook, and I need a volunteer. How about you, young man? Right. And your name? Neil. Neil, everybody, big hand for Neil. Yeah. Neil, I want you to grab this hook and just slowly walk in that direction up high, just so we can show everybody how long our leader is. I don't need to put it in okay. my mouth. Nah, I mean, if you want to, you can. <laughs> okay. Then flop around like a fish. Yeah. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Let's get that click around now. Keep in mind, stop for one second, Neil. Understand. That what I did, stop for one second, Neil. Stop, no, I'm not kidding. Is I've already hooked my bait on, okay? In my particular case, what's my choice bait? Live pinfish, right? Okay, and understand this too. If you're going to fish live pinfish all day long, you better have a pair of gloves on. I'm serious, you better have a pair of gloves because they've got all these little needles all over them and at the end of the day, you're gonna, you just won't believe how damaged your hands are. So anyhow, hook that pinfish through the chin from the bottom up on that circle hook and 
flip them out away from the boat and slowly feed out your leader. Now, by the way, this leader is 40 pound diamond presentation fluorocarbon. Is fluorocarbon necessary? No. Is it beneficial? Yes. Go ahead, keep going. So we're gonna feed that out. Go, 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 go. Keep on going. This is still our leader. Right, you're gonna wanna go that way. Keep on going. Keep on going. Okay, stop right there for me. Okay, now I don't know if you guys can even see him. He's so far away. Neil, where are you? There he is, okay, way over there. Bottom line, 50 to 60 feet. Okay, 50 to 60 feet. So when I'm fishing a very long leader that's 50 to 60 feet, I need to figure out a way to control all of that when I'm not fishing, when I'm traveling from one spot to the other, when I'm going back up for another drift. So the way that we rig these is slightly different than what we just talked about. At the end of this 50 foot leader, and again, I'm working my way back up this way, is that same very small Albright knot. Remember the Albright knot that we talked about? It's a very easy knot to tie. It's incredibly reliable from braid to fluorocarbon or monofilament. As long as you tie it properly, they say seven wraps up, seven wraps down. I do 13 up, 13 down. And I promise you it is bulletproof, okay? As long as it's tied right. I'm one of those people. I'm meticulous. When I am tying this knot, oh shit, snip, I tie it again. Don't think that every single knot that I tie is perfect. It's not. I'm human. I'm just like everybody else. I've tied this knot a thousand times and there's still many times where I'll look at it and go, man, I just don't like the way it looks. I don't like the way it wrapped. I don't like, you know, how it's seated. I don't go, all right, well, whatever. I'll deal with it later. No, I'm dealing with it right now because I may only have one shot at a giant fish like that, and I don't want to lose it to something that I could have corrected. So very small Albright knot, make sure it's right. Then as you can see, 12 inches up, 12 inches up from the knot is a very small loop in the braid, right there. I mean, I don't even know if you can see that from back there, but there is a loop in the braid. Again, the way that I tie this loop is you just put one line over the other, wrap around, 13 times, use that same 13 number. This isn't a uh, seminar on knot tying, but learn how to tie a loop knot. And like I said, 13 times. The key is when you look at this knot, and I'm gonna kind of just show it to you so you can see how the knot is coming off the center. Yep. See what I'm saying, how it comes out? The right loop the comes out of the center, yep. okay? The way this knot cinches down is both sides come together and the loop comes out the center. If the loop comes out one side or the other, the knot's not right. Retie it, okay? Retie it as many times as you have to until it's perfect. Otherwise, it will fail. I promise you, I've learned this the hard way. And that's also why I fish 40 pound braid. I usually fish 30 pound braid, but this knot is too fragile with 30 pound braid and you have to bump it up a little bit. And because this is a little bit heavier, it's also 50 feet away from the bait. So I'm not worried about stealth because it's 50 feet away from the bait. Now that my pinfish is out away from the boat, it's time to put on my lead. Depending on the depth and the speed of current, we will fish bank sinkers that are anywhere from eight to 16 ounces. The most common are 10 or 12. If I had to narrow it down to one, 12 ounces. I'm telling you, I've used every shape of sinker and you have to use a bank sinker. Don't, it makes a difference. I've tried egg sinkers that are large. They spin too much and they create too much of a tangle. Pyramid sinkers obviously could potentially get hung up in the bottom. You really want to use a bank sinker. Now this bank sinker is tied to a very short length of heavy 100 pound mono, heavy. Now you may say to yourself, wait a minute, Everything I've ever learned over the years is that when I tie a lead to a rig, that the lead should be tied on with a very thin line in case this gets hung up in the bottom, I could break out my lead because of that thin line and not lose the entire rig or potentially lose a fish. Certainly makes a lot of sense, not in this particular case. If you fish very thin line here, like 20 pound, it's so thin and fragile, it's going to wrap around this very thin braid and you're gonna be dealing with a tangle all day long. This heavy braid tangles nowhere near as much. Additionally, to prevent that spinning, I also put a small little ball bearing snap right up on top. And again, that snap 
is what's going on that loop. So as you can see, I'm hanging my lead right on the loop. So now as we deploy this, we simply put our snap on and with that eight foot rod, I can just poof, chuck the sinker this way. You know why I'm chucking it this way? Because I've got a 50 foot leader going this way with a live bait and I wanna keep that spread, right? Because if I don't keep that spread, that leader may helicopter around the main line. Does that ever, ever happen to anybody? Anybody ever get tangled? No. Okay. Well, with mutton snapper fishing, every second that I'm not effectively fishing is one second that I'm missing an opportunity to hook or catch that fish. So I'm very, very meticulous. So another thing that's real important, you'll notice that my knots are trimmed incredibly tight. Okay, tie this knot, pull it really, really tight, moisten it, pull it really tight, and then trim as close as you can. Because if you leave a tag in that's a quarter inch, on that lead, guess what gets caught on there? The braid, okay? So you have to trim these knots. You can see how streamlined. Also, a lot of guys are used to putting on a bank sinker with a loop, like they'll tie a loop in the end of this mono, and you just loop the loop through the bank sinker. This way you can switch sizes if you need to. Eh, gonna get tangled. I'm telling you, I've tried all of this. This is the, the most streamlined, simple and effective way that you can fish this. Now keep in mind, once we are fighting a fish, and you know, I'm gonna back up a step. Remember we talked about not using light line, okay? Because we, you know, generally you'd want the lead to break off. The thing is, once I throw this out there and it hits the bottom, I'm not dragging this across the bottom because if a mutton snapper, listen, You know what that sounds like magnified in the water? Boom, boom, I'm not kidding you. You're scaring every mutton snapper within a country mile. He's not coming to eat your bait. So as soon as this hits the bottom, we reel it up, okay? We reel it up a few cranks, okay? I have a 50 foot leader. I don't need my lead to be dragging on the bottom. My lead never gets hung in the bottom because it's not dragging in the bottom. And it never gets hung in the wreck because I'm not dropping it on the wreck. Okay, I'm dropping it way down current in either sand or open, you know, very low lying relief, very structure that's just a little bit off the bottom. This could be 10 feet off the bottom. It could be way up here. My bait is still in the strike zone. Mutton snappers are roaming right here throughout the water column. Okay, I've caught them 50 feet off the bottom. The rarity, but it's happened. So in turn, you don't need this to be on the bottom, nor do you want it to be on the bottom. In any way, crank it up. When you are drifting, you will notice your rod tip, Neil, you're such a good volunteer, man. We're almost done with you. You'll notice your rod tip will bounce as the boat is bouncing. And you will notice by looking at that rod tip, it'll go slack, you'll go, oh, my sinker's bouncing on the bottom. It's very easy to tell right from that eight foot soft rod tip. You can easily tell when that lead is bouncing on the bottom. What do you do? Crank it up a few more feet, okay? There are other times where every five, eight minutes, whatever it is, you know, maybe we have a fast drift and I wanna make sure that I have absolute bait awareness. I wanna make sure I know where my bait is, so I might go, boom, and hit the bottom, so I know, okay, I was eight feet, 10 feet, five feet, two feet, whatever, off the bottom, and then adjust accordingly again. So it's not set it and forget it. It's set it and monitor it and babysit it and do whatever you have to do to maximize on that entire drift. Once you hook a fish, remember what I said, hopefully this doesn't fall on you. If it does, Sue Marshall, not me. This rod will completely double over. Okay, you, there's no, they're not gonna nibble. The rod's gonna go whoop and just completely double over. Am I right? Okay, complete, they know. It's gonna completely double over. Get the rod out of the rod holder. Don't try and stop the fish, he's running. It's his first run, he's angry, he doesn't know what happened, he's excited, he just got hooked. Let him run. My drag is set properly. I could always tighten it, but I can't loosen it. So I lean on the side of a little bit looser rather than tighter. Because remember that that strike in that fish has to go all the way through the leader. He's also dragging this through the water. 
this alone creates drag, doesn't it? Right? So I can't just set my drag right here and go, you know, the breaking strength of this 30 pound braid, 40 pound braid, is obviously much more than this. I could apply a lot more heat, but this isn't where the pressure is being applied. It's going through the entire rod, 250 feet of line down to the bottom. Through this, I've got these multiple connection points. There's a lot of things happening here and a lot that could go wrong. So it's better to lean on the side of a little bit looser rather than a little bit tighter. And then as you're fighting the fish and slowly you get them up off the bottom, you can apply a little bit more heat if need be. Once you get all the way up to this, well, guess what? You can't reel this just like Joanne from Vermont couldn't reel the egg sinker through the tip. I can't reel that through the tip. So I have to take that off. So either if you're fishing with someone else on the boat, they can simply reach out, okay? And as a matter of fact, I'm gonna show you a neat little trick. This snap is closed, right? Closed, it's closed, okay? I do not have to open it to take it off, okay? Still closed, right? All I did was just take the loop and follow it around the little hook because follow me there, very easy. So it literally took, how long did it take me to remove that? Second. A fraction of a second. And trust me, when I know there's a 30 inch mutton on the other side, I'm even faster, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm fast. And if you fumble, that's okay too. Just slow down, make sure there's no slack here because that fish could spit the hook at any time. Once the lead is off, look what I could do. Only Guggen's fish with the clicker on, okay? <laughs> And I'm slowly going to, you could let that go. We're gonna reel up and I'm still fighting the fish, right? I'm enjoying the entire fight. I don't have to hand line them. Okay, you can drop that, there you go. Yep, the fish, the fish has now floated. The mutton snapper is way over there. He's 30, 40 feet away, he's floated. And slowly I'm just closing that gap and just slowly reeling them in. There's somebody standing by with a net. And like I like to say, right into the net, baby. Okay, head first. And in turn, it's just an overall much easier rig to fish. And then when I'm traveling, for example, I'm going up for another drift, all I have to do is take my hook, not in the eye of the guide, but on the foot or you know wherever you wanna fix it, and boom, I'm back in business. It's that simple. We get to a new spot, I grab that rod, I pop on a bait, I flip it out. Once I get to the loop, I pop my weight on, I chuck that in the opposite direction. It hits the bottom. I crank it three or four cranks off the bottom. Drag is set. I've double checked it. I put the rod in the rod holder. I now grab what is perhaps the most exciting and fun way to catch big mutton snappers, and that's jigging. Now, let me tell you something. I don't know if there's any fish to me that's as exciting as you know catching a big mutton snapper on a slow pitch jig because they are so challenging and they are so smart. So to me, it's not about anything other than that challenge that I fooled, I fooled such a brilliant fish into believing that this was worth eating, okay? That he actually ate this. I'm like, you ate that, okay? Why did he eat it? Because to you, this may be a piece of metal. To you, this may be a jig. To me, this is a ballyhoo. It's alive. It's alive and it's in my hands. I'm the one who is controlling this value. This happens to be a Mobster 250. It is my number one favorite jig. There's actually three jigs that I fish in the Keys, very much the, like the three live baits. I fish a Mobster 250, I fish a Mobster 250, and I fish a Mobster 250. You can get them from a company called Jigs R Us, and I heard through the grapevine that soon they're gonna be sold here too, okay? And like I said, it's called the Mobster. The silver glow, the blue are absolute killer colors. They have a wide range of colors. I can't speak for them all because these are the only ones that I fish because I have so much confidence in these colors. So I don't know if red, green, or orange works, okay? But I know that these work. It's three-sided, so it wobbles like crazy. I like to say with this jig, all you have to do is add water, okay? Just add water. You don't have to be a rock star slow pitch jig fisherman to be effective, you know? And slow pitch jigging, you know, I was talking to Brian, one of the employees here before, it's a science, right? And some people take it to the upper, upper level of that. 
and they make it such a science where it can be intimidating, where you go, oh my God, they have such specialized tackle and man, he's choosing between a 200 or a 220 gram jig or is it 225? Like what in the world? Dude, tie the jig on and drop it down. Okay, drop it down. That's it. It's 30 pound braid. It's 40 pound fluorocarbon leader. 15 to 20 feet is all that you need. Guess how I have the braid connected to the fluorocarbon, what not? I love you guys, okay? It's that simple. Keep things consistent. Master that all bright knot because you're going to use it a lot when it comes to mutton fishing. Hit the bottom. The strike zone is within 20 feet of the bottom. Let it go all the way to the bottom in free spool. Pay attention to what is happening because oftentimes fish will eat it on the way down. If you suddenly believe you're halfway down and you're completely slack, what happened? You just got bit. Baby, lock it up and just crank, okay, because you just got hit. If you do hit the bottom, lock it up and just bring that jig to life, okay, just bring it to life. Listen to what I'm saying. You don't have to do these super high sweeps. As a matter of fact, I don't even like the high sweep it or, you know, the high jig. It's just, try and do this without killing anybody. You know, just small, slow. Let the jig move. The key is... Move the jig before it stops moving. Does that make sense? Okay, because remember too that this is going to stop. Once you pitch it through the water, it's gonna wobble, but then at some point, it's gonna stop and just go dud. It's just gonna go dead. The idea is let it wobble, boom. Let it wobble, boom, wobble, boom. You know, I'm keeping it alive. I'm keeping that, you know, I guess a good way to say it is keep that heartbeat going. Okay, don't let it die, because if it dies, then they won't touch it. They won't eat it. So by fishing in my particular setup, 39 CV, I fish a bait rod right off the stern corner right here. I fish another bait rod right up off the bow, and then we jig in between the two. They never get tangled. There's 40 feet of space between them. If somebody wants to fish another bait, they wouldn't fish this rig right in the middle. They would fish the fish finder rig with the egg sinker because they're feeding it out away from the boat. So because remember, these are stationary, right? They're being dragged as the boat moves along. So by fishing a third bait in the center with the fish finder rig, they're constantly feeding it out. It's away from the other two baits. We have maximum separation. Very important when you're wreck fishing in the Keys or even up here. I'm telling you, I cannot stress this enough. The less that you're dealing with tangles and fumbling around and stuff that's keeping you preoccupied, the more effective you're gonna be. That's the bottom line. There's no other way, you know, and, and I, this applies obviously to all fisheries. Getting back to the jigging outfit, this is a six foot three inch rod rated for 150 to 400 grams, built right here at Chaos. It's actually a rod that I designed myself. It is matched to a Trinidad reel. This happens to be a size 14. A size 16 would be ideal. A size Trinidad 20 would also be ideal. There are other great reels like the Shimano Oshia Jigger in either the 15, which is real small, the 2000 is a decent size that you could fish on here. So there's a lot of options from Shimano that make really effective jigging reels. I like this because I jig a lot. And I gotta tell you that, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you, recently I switched to Shimano, switched to the Oshia jiggers, and I jigged a number of trips with them, and I learned that that just wasn't the right reel for me. It's a great reel, but it's a great reel in my opinion for a guy who's gonna jig for an hour or two. We don't jig for an hour or two when you come fishing with me. You better be prepared to jig for eight hours. Okay, and if you're jigging all day long, every ounce matters. Every gram matters. These reels are very compact, they're very light, but more importantly, they hold a tremendous amount of line. 450 yards of 30 pound braid. Any fish that smokes 450 yards of line out deserves to live, okay? Deserves to live. And keep in mind, let's not forget, I'm in a moving boat. I'm in a boat, I'm not anchored. So worst case scenario, you hook something that is just mind boggling, and I've hooked a lot of big fish jigging. 
you hook something that's mind boggling and you just can't stop them. And you're like, um, man, I don't know. Um, 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 let's go, let's go, let's go. It doesn't take long. And even if you get into a tangle with these two, I don't give a shit. I'm going to chase that yellowfin that just ate my jig, you know, or whatever it is. Okay, so keep that in mind. And that rarely, if ever, is going to happen. So, but plenty of line capacity, smooth drag, really, really important. Always check your knots, et cetera. Finally, you know, I don't want to say finally, but I just want to talk very briefly about the preferred tackle. Remember when I said to you another way to catch mutton snappers, especially fish in the 18 to 24 inch size, which are nice muttons. They're not the trophy, they're not the giants, they're not the mama jamas, okay, but they're not bad. A good way to catch those is on the patch reefs. Anchoring up, you're chumming, you're targeting potentially yellowtail snapper, mangrove snapper, but you also have a shot at mutton snapper. Like I said, I'm not saying you're never gonna catch a giant in 30 feet of water, but it's rare. They're mostly the medium sized fish. The proper setup, here it is, 12 to 20 pound, seven foot conventional rod. Again, who makes this? Yeah. Whoop, whoop, okay. <laughs> matched to something like a Torium 16. It's just a little workhorse. It's just a little conventional reel, little workhorse loaded with 20 pound mono, very light, very easy. I've beefed it up to a 30 pound fluorocarbon leader. So I went from 20 pound mono to 30 pound fluoro. I can't go heavier than that because I'm in really crystal clear shallow water. Okay, and stealth is really important. I'm telling you, these patch reefs down in the Florida Keys, there's days you can look 40 feet down and go, ooh, look at that little yellow tail. You know, like it just crystal clear. But at the same token, if you fish line that's too light, you're gonna get smoked every time and you're gonna lose the quality fish. So the right balance when the groupers and the nice muttons are on the patch reefs is 20-30. 20, 20 mono, 30 liter. The rig could not be any more simple, a half ounce jig head. Half ounce jig head, that's it. Don't get all fancy schmancy, let me tie on a fish finder rig with an egg sinker and a long leader. This isn't the place. All you gotta do to catch fish on Florida, you know, Florida Keys patch reefs is have an assortment of jig heads. That's it, that's all that you need is jig heads. The only key is what are you putting for bait on here? Now, if I'm targeting groupers and mutton snappers on the patch reefs, and I have this half ounce jig head, what am I putting for bait on here? Pinfish. Thank you, okay, a live pinfish. I'm not trying to catch the 12 inch yellow tail. I don't care about the 14 inch mangrove snapper. That's not what I'm after. I'm after the bigger stuff, the groupers and the mutton snappers, and they want something to eat. So I give them a live pinfish. If you don't have live pinfish, a butterfly ballyhoo, like we talked about before, a half of a large ballyhoo, you know, a nice, big, fresh, healthy bait, okay? Not something small and skimpy. Not something, you know, as I mentioned, that I do often is fish those patch reefs for the muttons, but it is a viable fishery. It can be very consistent, especially on days when it's too rough to fish offshore. And, you know, in the Florida Keys and even here, there's a big difference sometimes between fishing from the first and second reef, you know, 30, 70 foot, and then 250. A lot can change in that small window. You're flagged. Okay, so in turn, it's always good to be ready for everything. But like I said, if you're really focused on those large mutton snapper, it's all about fishing offshore. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Captain Mike. I'm the founder of Florida Sport Fishing Magazine, a creator and host of Florida Sport Fishing TV. And that is my mutton snapper seminar. So. Thank you. I'll be up here for a little while. We're going to do a little raffle. Do you have some raffle with some giveaways as usual? Um, and then I'll be up here answering whatever questions that you may have. Again, I just want to remind everybody, please join Florida Sport Fishing TV Plus at fsftv.com. Gives you an open line of communication to me, and I'll answer any questions that I may have missed, uh, you know, regarding any topics. Guys, thank you again for joining us here. Another big hand for the chaos crew. And get out your raffle tickets, because we got some good ones.